the River Thames flows through a city steeped in history. Ever since Roman times, London has depended on the river for trade and transport. It's a unique partnership which goes back over 2,000 years. Here on the foreshore at the Tower, ordinary Londoners can get a little bit closer to the city's history for just one weekend in the year. Graham Keevil was one of the archaeologists running this special day. Well, the purpose of today is to allow people to get down onto the foreshore here at the Tower of London to see the fantastic archaeology that, that is actually there. All the rubbish that people threw away over centuries and centuries at the Tower is still down there. Even before the Tower was built in the Roman era, people were throwing away rubbish into the river. And you are going to be looking around on the foreshore for who knows, all kinds of stuff. As I said, all of London's history is here from Roman right through to modern day. You are looking for various archaeological items, bits of pot and shard, all kinds of things. There will be archaeologists down there for you to talk to. There's also a table for washing your finds just up here. Bring them up by all means, have them washed down and you can uh, talk to archaeologists. People rarely have an opportunity to get directly involved in archaeology themselves, to pick up the pottery which people were handling hundreds, in some cases even thousands of years ago. That looks as though that used to have a handle on that pot, don't you think? What did you think that was? I was hoping it was going to be human. Paul Grasner has been coming to these archaeological weekends for years. We'll find a, a moment to sit and look at things and say, you know, was this the the finest thing in a humble home or the most humble thing in a fine home and, and who last touched this. We found Roman pottery and that kind of thing. And you think, am I the last person to have touched this item since its owner dropped it in the Thames as a votive offering or something? It's that's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing experience. Gustav Milne is something of an expert on London's foreshore as he's made the first complete archaeological survey of the city's muddy margins. What we find on the foreshore is the cross-section of the material culture, the artefacts, the things you've thrown away from everyday life. This includes pottery, which could have been imported from anywhere over the Great British Empire. Even in the Roman period, we get ceramics from the Mediterranean, pottery imported from all over the Roman Empire, and anything that's thrown away is likely to be washed up on the foreshore at some stage. It's a piece of uh, Roman roof tile. I think it's absolutely brilliant. I think it's great because it's a bit of history in your hands and you can't believe it survived all this time. Wonderful. Here at the Church of St Magnus the Martyr is one of the oldest pieces of Roman London that's ever been excavated from the foreshore. Gustav Milne. This particular timber is actually 2,000 years old and it comes from a Roman wharf part of the port of Roman London, which was here in the first and second century. We know this was Roman because it was recovered with a lot of Roman pottery, which we were able to date with some precision. Since then, we've excavated a number of other sites next door to this original site, and we have a whole series of absolute dates for these Roman timber keys dating from AD 62, uh, AD 78, uh, AD 93. So we know precisely the stages of development of the Roman timber key 2,000 years ago. During the Roman period, the river was shallower and more than half a mile wide at this point. The foreshore was muddy and flat with marshes and sandbars and creeks. This made the Thames a treacherous river for Roman ships to navigate. Even so, London prospered, and the remains from the Roman city still can be found today. And here we have more Roman roof tile. Another piece I found a little bit further along the beach earlier on. This is the one known as the tegula. It's the flat tile which sits on the roof like that. This upstanding bit that would have been like a shallow U shape, and you fit two of these together, and then put another tile over the top of them, known as an imbrex, which just like, looks like a half drain pipe. And that covers over these two parts and seals the whole thing in so that the roof is watertight. So that's nearly 2,000 years old. London became an important trading port, and Roman ships and galleys would bring their cargoes here from throughout the known world. 
But we do have a couple of pots here that do tell us about the river in that they haven't come from this country. Most of these pots were made in this country, but this one here, this is a Samian bowl. Uh, it's a type of pottery made in the Roman Empire. This one, the first and second century, and it comes from Gaul, so France. And it's even got, you can just see in the inside here, the stamp of the person who made it. And of course, this is being traded in. This is imported into this country. In the Roman era, this is the absolute best pottery you can buy. This is the top quality tableware. High quality pottery like this tells archeologists that Roman London grew to be a wealthy city. The Romans also built the first bridge over the river. But when they abandoned the city, it was nearly a thousand years before a new wooden bridge was built in the same place. That bridge became the artificial limit of navigation. So trading ships also had to stop at the bridge and that was the opportunity for them to offload their cargoes and take on the new imports from London. So the bridge, the medieval bridge, built as a barrier in about 1000 AD, kick-started the economy of London by presenting the city with the limit of navigation for all traffic using the Thames. There's been a bridge built on the same site ever since. The city became a major port and one of the world's biggest commercial centres, all because a bridge built here over a thousand years ago stopped ships from going any further upstream. Back on the foreshore, the falling tide is revealing new surprises. I think it's Tyrannosaurus Rex. Oh, do you? Oh. A baby one. Right. We don't really know anything about archaeology, so we just came down just for a fun day out. And um, we've just, I think my daughter's found some kind of bone. I don't know what kind of bone it is. Do you show? And it's not only man made objects that are found on the foreshore. There's a whole history here of Sunday dinners throughout the ages. It might not be, we're not sure what it is. <laughs> These are two bones of, uh, these are the foot bones, as it were. That's a sheep, which you can see it's very slight. That's those two little things there, the cloven hoof of the sheep. And this is exactly the same bone, but from a cow, the, the cloven hoof of a cow. So a whole range of different species here, uh, all the, the usual food species, uh, suggesting that they ate very well in the tower. By the Middle Ages, the city was a thriving port and the river was packed with shipping this part of the Thames in front of the tower is called the Pool of London and it's where medieval trading ships would anchor. Here on the foreshore, Gustav has found more evidence that the river was very different then. You can see the level of the Thames has changed very dramatically over time. If you look at the top, you can see that's nice fresh stonework and a fresh balustrade up there. And as you work your way down, you'll see the stonework changes and gets uh, very green. And then right at the bottom, you can see the bottom three courses actually are very badly eroded indeed and the, all the mortars washing out of the joints. Now that actually is a medieval stone wharf. That's the wharf that was built in the 14th century and it's been heightened and refaced over the succeeding 700 years. So that's maybe where the top of the river was in the 14th century. This would have been part of the working wharf uh, there would have been ships moored here and the material which was being brought into the tower or exported out of the tower would have been lined up on the wharf. There would have been cranes, workshops, warehouses here and this would have actually been a very much a thriving part of the working port of London but relating to the tower, the king and warfare. Most times that Paul Grasner has been on the foreshore he's found evidence of medieval warfare and this year is no exception. But every year we found chain mail, and this year we found it, and we found several links together, like maybe eight to ten links together at the most, and then individual links in the past. But this looks like it's quite a lot, and uh, one of the things that we're really excited about doing is asking Graham Keeble and some of these, these people in the know here whether um, there was indeed chain mail manufactured at the tower, because that would have a, a particularly exciting kind of of turn on it, but it, it almost looks like it's brass or something here. If you're looking at the, the way it, it's shining, and then the area that was more exposed to the water, um, you know, it's more tarnished. But I think the the thing that we've learned that's absolutely amazing is that the Thames is the uh, the biggest archaeological site in London, and it changes twice a day. <laughs> Thank you.
It's the one weekend in the year that Londoners can become amateur archaeologists for the day. People have been down on the foreshore now for several hours and their findings are coming in thick and fast. Graham Keyville and the other experts are kept busy identifying the artefacts. Mm. third year in a row we're finding yeah. Those look, look like bits of mail, those that smaller like pieces. Of there, maybe, yeah. huh? And again, it, it's not a particularly uncommon thing to find down on the foreshore because we know there were arms manufacturers in the tower during the medieval period and later and they were making everything from chain mail through to cannon, cannonballs, pistols, muskets, pikes, the whole lot. There's a whole load of workshops down the other end of the wharf. So that's where we were, too. Exactly, we were right underneath that, so it's the perfect place for it. As the city continued to grow in the 14th century, trade and shipping increased. Gustav Milne visits another medieval site that was only discovered 30 years ago when the foreshore was excavated for a new building. The building just behind me over there with the two flags on it looks like a very modern building. It's put up in about 1973, but actually it's the site of the heart of the medieval harbour. That was the site of the Custom House, which originally dates back to about 1380 when it was called the Wool House. The reason for the Custom House is quite simply because the kings and queens of England, uh, their expenditure tended to outstrip their income. So they needed to make as much money as possible, so they hit on the idea of taxing uh, imports and exports. The vessels would come upriver, and quite a lot of ships would actually be moored in midstream. So you must imagine this part of London to be choked with shipping, not just moored up against the quays offloading their cargoes, but parked up waiting for their chance to get up to the quays and offload their cargoes and take on the new cargoes. London became so successful by the 17th and 18th centuries that the Pool of London was packed with shipping. The port was so busy that sometimes ships waited for months to unload their cargoes. Archaeologists can tell a lot about these new imports from the artefacts found in the river. These were made in the Rhineland area of Germany from the 16th century onwards, but most of them are 17th and 18th centuries. And the great thing about it is to have this lovely big face on the joint between the neck and the body with a big flowing beard. And the whole point about these, again, is they don't come from this country. They are traded, they're being brought into this country. It's an import, the stuff that's supposed to be inside it, the wine that goes with the jug itself is important as well. The wine trade was very, very important in terms of the eco economy of the country in the medieval period and later. So these are the kind of pieces which tell us more than just about daily life. They tell us about how the river was influencing London and how Londoners lived. As the afternoon wears on, the archaeologists are kept busy identifying all the new finds, which give an insight into how Londoners lived in the past. Okay, that, that's going to be medieval, I would have thought. Um, you're looking similar to these kind of things, which are, those ones were 13th century. Those look a bit more pointed. Those could be going more up towards Tudor. I think that's likely to be some sort of late medieval. Probably all those pieces are by the looks of them. Tiny feet, aren't they? Oh, yeah. But a lot of them, they're wrapped very, very tightly around the feet. We found a Tudor uh, stove tile that was green, and it had a, a Tudor rosette and a crown on it. And uh, it was one of those pieces that I knew it was, it was something kind of cool. But, but I love it when the archaeologists don't want to hand it back to you. They keep wanting to hold it just a little bit longer. And... Bowl. 17th, 18th century. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it, that one? Good red earth and wear. That one could just be the slightly earlier. As British trade continued to expand in the 17th and 18th centuries, so the Port of London continued to grow and become one of the biggest and most important harbours in the world. Because of the city's success in the maritime trade, the Thames foreshore also became an important place for building ships. Gustav knows exactly where to look in the Thames mud for evidence of this great maritime industry. There was something like um, 5,000 ships built on the Thames since about 1600. It was a massive shipbuilding area, one of the most important in England, in Britain. So shipbuilding, ship repair was crucial to the prosperity of the port. It was a major service industry and this part of London on both banks of the river, this is what working maritime London was all about.
Here on the foreshore is the remains of a small passenger boat and a statute in 1555 records the size of those vessels as being seven meters long and about one and a half meters wide. Here you see the overlapping or clinker built planks held in place by these little copper rivets. Um, we've got the two sides of it coming together at the stern post which is the, the back end of the vessel, uh, which is that large, fatter timber rising up out of the mud. And that modest looking vessel, that is exactly the size of the craft that you would have seen 4,000 of running up and down the river in the 16th century. Back at the Tower of London, the tide is now rising and covering the foreshore for another day. I found all sorts of bits and pieces, and I love them. The blue pottery, I know it's probably not very old, but it's very pretty. And pipes. A very nice pipe, and I'm told it's um, quite old, because they're disposable throwaway pipes. Throw them in the river, have a good smoke. It was Christopher Columbus who first brought tobacco to Europe but it wasn't introduced to England till the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. It became an instant success, but it was so expensive it was sold in pre-packed disposable clay pipes. Today the foreshore is littered with the remains of London's throwaway society. The base of a clay pipe, you can't see the whole thing, some of it's broken off and shattered in the river. And you'd buy a, a pipe full of tobacco from a street side vendor who'd be selling, uh, selling pipes and uh, you'd smoke it and then throw, the, uh, throw the, uh, the discarded pipe into the, into the river and not think anything of it, not think that 200 years later someone's going to be coming along and, and, and picking it out of the river. But you can tell the age of them by their size. This one obviously hasn't got a complete bowl, but you can picture the bowl coming up to here. So it's probably a sort of, maybe a 200 years old. This little yep. pipe. Good clay pipe. This is sort of in between. It's not the tiny little ones that you get in the early, um, well, late, 17, late 16th, early 17th century, when they're, they're prizing the tobacco. It's still quite rare, quite expensive. So they make really tiny little bowls and only smoke a little bit at a time. They're obviously starting to get a bit more tobacco now, so it's the same sort of shape but getting bigger. So this is probably second half of the 17th century, 16, 1670s, 1680s, somewhere around there. Nice example. Nice. Further upstream, Gustav is uncovering more secrets of London's thriving maritime past. This area would have been a hive of industry. These foreshores were very much workplaces. The river itself would have been full of traffic. And the river level itself would also have been changing because we have a very important date in London's history in 1832 when the old London Bridge is destroyed and a new London Bridge with wide arches is built. But what we have on this part of the foreshore is amazingly the working foreshore as it would have been from the 17th right the way through to the 19th century. Shipbuilding, barge building, boat and barge repair. This is part of a windlass capstan type device, a lifting device, from a ship which is probably late 17th or 18th century in date. It's quite an old bit of ship, but it survives in quite good con con condition and you can see that the, the sort of hand spikes that go in there and you would pull this over. There's the cogs to take the winding mechanism and then the ropes would haul the mast, haul the sails, if it's a sailing ship, bring up the anchor, all those sort of lifting devices. Nearby, there's more evidence of the shipbuilding industry. Here, old timbers have been deliberately placed on the foreshore as a platform to allow boats to dry out on the mud. The first one we see here is actually an old ship's timber, probably 18th century in date. And if you put this upright, you'll see that it's the rudder, the turning mechanism of a very large timber sailing ship. This vessel would have been twice the size of that barge and you'd have been able to step from the deck straight onto the top of that wharf with no problems at all. We are talking a big ship here. It's getting close to the end of the day, but Paul Grasner has made yet another discovery. Found a child's ring. Nick, do you want to model this ring? Well, let's look. This looks like this was for a child. Let me see your finger. Put it on your finger.
I can't immediately see any hallmarks, so I don't think it's going to be pure silver at least. It's got a quite a nice little gemstone in there, a bit of decoration here. A child's ring? Or yeah, a, that or a, a lady with small fingers, let's put it that way. Staffordshire. Victorian. Yeah, both of those. See, that's a wig curler for rather than hair, but for wigs. Just warm these up. It's basically factory pipe clay, so it'll go to quite high temperature. Wind the hair of the wig round it, leave it in overnight, pull it out, and it's set. So who, who would have, who would have worn, worn those wigs? Men and women. I found, well, first of all, this stamp, which I'm imagining it might come from a customs house where they were stamping goods arrive, and then eventually it broke and someone just threw it in the river. So it certainly came from something on the, on the riverside. This is the sort of stuff which is being made all around London in the, uh, in this particular case, probably 18th century. It might be a little bit earlier than that. Good, chunky, big storage jar. Really big thing like this. You can see from, if you sort of try and work, make that into a circle, it's going to be really quite massive. And not really capable of, doing of course, the day does bring some disappointments and not everything has an historical value. It's a cover for electricity ducts. Oh, really? So it's a safety cover, basically. Oh, OK. Woolworths, vintage 1976. Probably. <laughs> 20th century wine glass. Oh, it is. <laughs> oh, disappointment. We said it at the beginning of the day. The whole point about this is to let people get down there and get their fingers dirty and really touch the stuff. Well, they did that in spades today. You know, you had people down there digging around in, in the sand and the gravel, picking things up, coming and asking questions. It's absolutely fantastic, yeah, absolutely as good as it could have got today. Late summer and rowing boats of every shape and size gather on the Thames at Richmond for the 2004 Great River Race. Over the next few hours, 260 boats will be rowed or paddled down the 22 miles of river between here and Greenwich. The crews have come from all over Britain and even from abroad. Great River Race is very famous. There are lots and lots of crews from Holland here. You, you get uh, chicken skin to, to be there, just to row there. It's, it's amazing, it's great, we love to be here. This side of the yellow boy will intrigue the sound. Then coming towards me. Go, go that way, this way. Go down here, do you like that? I'll take this end up there, because he's going to have to get in here, isn't he? One, three, four, come over here! The race only started in 1988, but it's continued to grow over the years. It commemorates an ancient trade of watermen who provided regular passenger boat service on the River Thames for at least a thousand years. Many of the boats competing in the race are replicas of traditional Thames watercraft used over the centuries. Mark Edwards has built 15 of them and he's got last minute tweaks to make before the start of the race. In the last 24 hours there's been uh, six of us on it, flat out. And no doubt we'll be doing something for the last moment and then I jump in a boat at 12 o'clock and race myself. That's it then. It was peace and quiet once you get in the boat. Brilliant. Mark will be racing a replica of a boat, once as common on the river as black cabs are on the streets of London today. And they did much the same job. This is a, a Thames wherry. It's a replica of an 18th century wherry. She'd have carried the passengers. She's a bit of a funny angle at the moment. We're about to wash her bottom off, ready for the race. But she'd have carried her passengers in the, the stern end there, the back end, with a nice big seat back. And then the waterman would row from these positions up here. They're designed to be bow loading, so that the passengers would normally be asked to walk forward. There'd be a foredeck here, and they'd get over this very sharp, long bow, but that can plough in on a, a gravel foreshore or steps and can take the iron band, can take the rubbing. And in fact, hidden in here, 
of our secret weapon. That's a solid piece of wood there. So that's designed for running in on gravel and hard rocks to protect the boat down there. It's solid wood. As well as wherries, there are other traditional Thames boats in the race, like cutters and skiffs. But any rowing boat can enter the race. Today there's whalers and gigs, modern fiberglass catamarans, and even Chinese dragon boats. The earliest type of boat here is a curra, an ancient design made from wicker covered in animal hide. These boats were used on the Thames long before the Vikings raided London over a thousand years ago. One golden rule of the race is that all boats must carry a passenger in honour of the Thames watermen. In Tudor times, they were some of the most important tradesmen in London. In 1555, an Act of Parliament led to the foundation of the Company of Watermen. This is the courtroom of the company, part of the original hall, and we, uh, we are the only Georgian hall left in the city. Bob Crouch started working over 50 years ago as an apprentice waterman, and he rose through the ranks to become master of the company. This is the master's chair, and the master of the day will sit here, and normally the, the court sit on either side, and he has, there's a long table in front. Before the development of modern roads and railways, the river was the quickest way to get around the city. So the watermen had the upper hand when it came to offering a comfortable journey around town. To travel by carriage through the streets was literally a teeth-jarring experience. The sedan chairs weren't uh, much better, they keep dropping you and putting you down heavily. So to travel by boat was a, was a comfortable and safe means of, of transport. For centuries, London only had one river crossing, the old London Bridge. So an important part of a waterman's business was ferrying people across the river. There was a lot of business to be had uh, taking people across at Wapping, for instance. Otherwise, uh, somebody wanting to go to Wapping from, say, Deptford would have to walk all the way up to the bridge, across and then down the other side. Another lucrative route was taking people across the river to the South Bank, then considered to be a place of very dubious entertainment. The city fathers didn't want all this activity, bull baiting and uh, theatres, uh, brothels. So people would travel across, particularly young, young blades from the city would, uh, would take a boat and go across and uh, be, be skinned alive for their, <laughs> for their purses almost. The Waterman's Company had a stranglehold on river traffic and they strictly controlled both the boats and the watermen. They regulated both the watermen themselves, who had to do a seven-year apprenticeship, and then had an examination to make certain they were capable of rowing people about. And then they'd uh, register their craft, the wherries and skiffs, be registered to carry a certain number of people so they couldn't overburden them. And then they'd register the steps or the stairs, similar to these, would be inspected. And same as you have a taxi rank, the wherries would come into the stairs, all dressed up with their posh cushions and what have you. There'd be an array of boats, and they'd shout oars or skulls, according to which way they were set up. And the uh, pa potential passengers or customers, clients these days, would look out and would choose and select the particular boat that they like the look of. They might have a particular waterman. I mean, Mr. Peeps had a particular waterman that he would uh, employ. And they'd come pushing in between the other wherries and take their fare, and off they'd go to Greenwich or whatever. Like taxi drivers today, watermen had a reputation for strong opinions and even stronger language. Over the years, there are many stories of arguments between watermen and their clients. Watermen have always suffered from this story that they were rogues and thieves and robbing uh, barges in the port. In fact, they had to be very careful not to uh, insult their passengers. Uh, and their way of getting around this, of course, was to insult each other, which they knew the passenger would listen to and therefore take care of not arguing about the, the fare or 
one of the other things that Waterman suffered from was people running off without paying. Whatever the rights and wrongs, Waterman led a precarious existence. In winter, when the Thames froze over, they scraped a living by holding frost fairs on the ice. A bit of a dangerous place to be, but the Waterman tried to entice people onto it. There's even a, uh, evidence that uh, dead bodies were used and, f and frozen in coffins and uh, a tent rig around them so that people could come and see maybe a, a, a woman that had died in childbirth with her child next to her. You know, pretty macabre stuff, but uh, this is what they had to do to earn some sort of living. Another form of watercraft once common on the Thames was a shallop. This was for wealthier clientele and more of a stretch limo than a taxi cab. Richer people would have their own means of transport, so if you were wealthy enough to have your own vessel, uh, in today's terms, uh, a limousine, you would have a thing called a shallop. Now these were four, six, eight, or even ten oared, depending on how important you were and how much you could afford to pay for a crew. And these were very fast and became highly decorated because the river was not only the artery of London, but also the the space where you could entertain, where you could show off. This is the Jubman, one of several shallops in the race. This year, Jubman will be crewed by the Twickenham Rowing Club. They've been out in the river for the past three months, training hard under the stern eye of skipper Simon Elsie. It is quite competitive and we want to try and get a reasonable time. Uh, we did well last year, but uh, didn't quite get the position we wanted to. This year we've got four passengers as well, so that's going to make life a little bit more interesting. The very wealthiest members of London society, such as royalty or the ancient livery companies, displayed their wealth on vast exotic barges. A barge, enormous row barge, sometimes 100 foot long, there was enough room in their cabins, with 21 oarsmen normally, for people to walk around and dine on board. So the London livery companies vied with each other for the splendour of their barges, uh, which would all turn out for the Lord Mayo's procession each year. But these were enormous crafts, an enormous amount of wealth displayed. Back at the start, there's a conspicuous display of wealth. So no change there, then. There we are. We have the mayor from the start, the mayor from the finish, and some from in between also in which there are... Mayors from London's riverside boroughs have started to arrive, but not by river, though. To all the visitors... Some of them will be passengers in the race. Others will watch from the comfort of the riverbank. Either way, the competition is fierce, even if discreetly expressed. I have told my team they've got to come back with a trophy. And knowing once was very well, I can assure you we will be back with the trophy. Mind your backs, please. The Great River Race has an elaborate system of handicapping to give every boat an equal chance of winning. The starting times are staggered, with the smallest and slowest boats going first, and the bigger boats with the most oarsmen starting later. The Jubilant is a fast boat with eight oarsmen, so she starts at the back of the fleet, number 188 out of 260 boats. The jubilant makes its way to the starting line under the direction of Doug Davidson, who's Cox for the day. Whilst all the crew have seen better times, they're an old lot, aren't they? I'm, I think I'm the youngest one as I look down. Anyway, they've all been um, done a bit of rowing in their time, so they're, they're what we would call veteran rowers now. In terms of a race plan, um, I've got a plan, but I, and I haven't told them yet, but um, if I told them, they wouldn't have turned up. Five, four, three, two, one, go! Go, Go! Go, go, go. go. And so begins the 2004 Great River Race. Even the fastest boats will take two and a half hours to complete the course. Jubilant's crew wants to beat its own record and maybe even win the race.
The 2004 Great River Race has begun and the crew of Jubilant is finding the going tough. They've overtaken a few boats, but they're faster ones coming up from behind. As the race progresses, the Jubilant slowly begins to overtake the other boats in its class. This is where all those weeks of training begin to pay dividends, or not. All the boats in the race have now started, and the organisers are making their own way down river, in style. The person in charge is Stuart Wolfe. We have a computer programme which handicaps the boat, and it does every boat that takes part has to fill in a, a measurement form giving all the vital statistics of the boat. All those are put into the program which initially works out the wetted surface area of the boat and then the coefficient of friction. That gives you an estimated hull speed for the boat. Then we put in the power, that's the number of oars or paddles and the types of oars or paddles and that gives you the maximum, the optimum speed for the boat. It's the crew that gets the most potential performance out of its own boat that wins overall or, or, or in a class. The Great River Race was originally inspired by the races organised by the Company of Watermen. The most famous of all was Doggett's Coat and Badge Race, which started in 1715. It was a graduation event for newly qualified apprentices and it's still raced today. Once the trainees completed their seven-year apprenticeship, they're entitled to wear a large shoulder badge showing they were fully licensed to carry passengers. There's a lot to learn, you know, the river is completely different in different weather conditions and the idea was at least that, you know, they, they were apprenticed in different areas and learned different experiences um, and they understood the problems of other traffic. So if you're in a rowing boat, you'd probably be on a board a barge for a year or two so that you could actually understand the problems of a sailing barge moving up and down the river. Because until you understand uh, the problems other people have, you can't navigate your boat safely. Very important, even today. Well done, guys. That's good. The rules of the river which the ancient watermen followed still apply. All race boats must keep to the right of the river. Jubilant's crew are making good progress. We're over halfway. It's looking good. The crew are still together. The spirits are still high. I better just look where we're going. We don't want to hit anybody. On board the Jubilant, as a passenger, is the Mayor of Lambeth. and of the 11, I think there's only three of us that have actually come on the boat. Um, so maybe that says something about other London mayors. So hopefully this is a challenge laid down next year when they see this programme. After passing Westminster Bridge, Jubilant hits rough water. These are the very conditions the watermen were taught to cope with hundreds of years ago. Come on, let's go for it. Let's catch it up. Today, there's some 25 feet between high and low water twice a day. It wasn't as much as that before the river was embanked, but it was still pretty um, substantial. And, of course, with the old London Bridge, the 19 Arch Bridge, which was there for all those hundreds of years, uh, acting as a barrier, and as the tide went out below the bridge, the water above the bridge couldn't escape as quickly and therefore created a weir effect. And there was a drop of some five feet uh, on some states of tide going down through the bridges. Each bridge is different, and so one of the 
things you have to do as an apprentice is to learn all these different um, ways of reading the different bridges. Uh, London Bridge, for instance, the courses of the stonework. Other bridges, it will be uh, well, how clear the nose of the coffer dam is out of the water. And it's quite accurate, actually, once you know it. You'll notice on London's bridges, tied boards are very few and far between. And this has been something that watermen have uh, uh, made sure of for a long, long time. Otherwise, everybody could do it. <laughs> Watermen to this day still hate bridges and we, we've got great enjoyment from the wobbly bridge, wobbly, but you can't stop progress and gradually over the years more and more bridges have been thrown across the Thames and may have made life easier for the citizens but it made life more difficult for the watermen because there's navigational implications when a bridge is put across the tidal. The choppy water by the Tower of London is giving some of the smaller boats problems. The Great Tower of London, started in 1066. William the Conqueror. And the last time we lost a home. This is where the race begins. So let's build. This is where all that training slogging it away for three months solid, this is where it counts. Give it to me. Give it to me. Give it to me. The boats are now on the last exhausting leg of the race and the crews are approaching the finishing line at Greenwich. I know it's hard. The teams now need all the encouragement they can get. It's going to be a close finish for the Jubilant as the shallot closes in on a leading boat. It'll be some time before the results are finally worked out. But when they're announced, Jubilant's crew will discover there's no prize from this year since they finished fourth in their class. Completely shattered. First parts we ate, I didn't even know I had. Um, but uh, yeah, it was good. It was a good row. We, we worked well together. Um, it was hard, hard with the wind. The wind made rowing the stub boat quite tricky. It was okay when we had the wind in our favour, but when we had it, it was hard work. But uh, yeah, it was good. No, we enjoyed it. We uh, overtook a, quite a few crews. A couple of faster crews overtook us, but that was inevitable given the different types of boat that there are. So, all in all, I think uh, it's been a great race and uh, I'm really proud of the lads. Oh, I'm back. The 2004 Great River Race is over until next September. But it's growing bigger every year, a fitting tribute to one of London's oldest professions and a celebration of four and a half centuries of the Company of Watermen. From that high point of 40,000 watermen working on the river, probably today we've got, I think we've got active licences of less than 1,000. The future, as, as I can see it now, is, um, is a water park. You know, London's water park will be the Thames. <laughs>